Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome former Dean of the San Jose State College of Science and currently special advisor to the Provost, Michael Parrish. Good evening, and uh, thanks for coming to the um, third in our series of um, Industrial Revolution 4 talks. Um, tonight's subject is um, artificial intelligence and con convolutional neural networks. And um, if there's any area um, in this series that really emphasizes the necessity and importance of interdisciplinary um, cooperation, it's this one. Because um, in order to really understand and develop both neural networks and our true artificial intelligence, you need to have collaboration between people from areas like neurobiology, um, psychology, um, obviously um, network design, uh, programming. And it's something that we really uh, emphasize at San Jose State, and um, it's something that um, I think that we uh, truly value um, in our collaboration with these groups. Um, I would like to um, acknowledge our sponsors tonight. We have uh, ESDA and uh, Team Hogan. And um, we're very thankful for them and for their involvement. And um, what we're going to do next is I'm going to introduce Sean O'Kane, who um, is going to, in turn, introduce the panel of experts. You know, this is an area that um, is rapidly evolving in Silicon Valley, and we have uh, really an outstanding panel of people um, who have expertise in this field. So uh, without any further ado, I will hand it over to Sean. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Welcome, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good to see you. Good. What a great crowd for a Monday. Mm. Uh, my name is Sean O'Kane. I'm with Cadence Design Systems, and uh, uh, I'm the marketing director there, and also um, I'm the president of Big Kahuna Productions. It's a video production um, uh, and a group that uh, works with many of the high-tech companies in, in the valley here. So, once again, welcome to Jim Hogan's Fourth Industrial Revolution, the Cognitive Era Speaking Series. Tonight's panel discussion is on artificial intelligence and convolutional neural networks. So this uh, series helps unlock really exciting possibilities and change the way we make decisions and interact with people to solve our biggest challenges. So tonight, the panel is a whole lot smarter than I am, and, and uh, my job is to uh, keep it very simple, keep it at a thousand foot view. They're going to take a technical deep dive um, and uh, give you more of an understanding. I'd like to give you more of an understanding of how AI and uh, neural networks can be applied in our life. So the Capabilities generally classified as artificial intelligence include successfully understanding human speech, autonomous cars, um, interpreting complex data, including images and video. So the term artificial intelligence is applied when um, a machine mimics cognitive functions that humans associate with other humans, such as learning and, and pro problem solving. So. Now, if you think about convolutional neural networks, using um, it's, it's like using multiple copies of the same neuron in different places. It's like writing a function once and using it multiple times uh, in programming. So the network is, a, is better able to model data when it learns how to do something once and then uses that in multiple places. So we're going to talk about that as well. So here's some examples that um, that I'd just like to share with you. In the, some of the emerging areas, uh, putting substance behind some of those billion dollar projections. So the first one is something near and dear to me, and to my heart, is advanced melanoma screening and detection. So my early detection was my wife, when uh, she saw something, spotted something on my chest, and she goes, that doesn't look right. So uh, timing is everything, and now I have a foot scar from here to here, and I get checked every six months. Uh, so she was my early detection, and I was pretty darn lucky. 
So researchers at the University of Michigan are putting advanced imaging recognition to work detecting melanoma, one of the most aggressive types of cancer that is treatable at the early stages. So today, high-resolution imaging is so sophisticated that we're relying on it for uh, recognition for security systems, traffic recognition for our vehicles, and uh, autonomous uh, oh, or the autonomous vehicle of the future, and there's a little pitch here, using a tensilica, tensilica vision processor, which Chris Rowan might mention or talk a little bit about during the panel discussion. So there's a great opportunity to use neural networks uh, and neural network techniques to enhance computer vision applications with a very high level of accuracy. So neural networks, I'm sticking with, with healthcare, neural networks for brain cancer detection. Um, a team of French researchers note that spotting invasive brain cancer cells during surgery is very, very difficult, in part because of the effects of lighting in the operating room, which is interesting. So they found that using neural networks in conjunction with biomedical optics during operations allows them to detect the cancerous cells earlier and easier and reduce residual cancer post-surgery. Pretty good. Here's another example. Um, and this will prime you in, in for thinking about some of the questions you might want to ask, how that may apply to your life or career when we bring the, the panelists up and we'll have a Q&A. Energy market price forecasting using neural networks. So researchers in Spain and Portugal have applied artificial neural networks to the energy grid to uh, effort, as an effort to uh, uh, predict price and usage fluctuations. So a lot of different examples from weather forecasting to disaster event detection, civil and me mechanical engineering to sociology, psychology, and the humanities many different disciplines this touches. So AI and neural networks are paving the way to solve our biggest challenges through innovation, saving time, money, and lives. So this is not a comprehensive list, uh, but we will talk about many, many different areas. Uh, and in many different disciplines have been added in just this past year. And we're just at the beginning of the mainstream applications for deep learning. So once again, I really thank you for joining us tonight. Right now, we'd like to welcome our, uh, to the stage our host, Mr. Jim Hogan, who's held, held a senior engineering and marketing and operational management positions at Cadence Design Systems, National Semiconductor, and Phillips Semiconductor. <laughs> Serves on the board of advisors at San Jose State's School of Engineering and is currently the managing partner of Vista Ventures, Mr. Jim Hogan, right here. Thanks, Sean. Uh, this gentleman is a Silicon Valley entrepreneur and technologist. We'd like to welcome Mr. Chris Rowan. He is the co-founder and CEO of Sonics Incorporated, Mr. Drew Wingard. He is a registered patent attorney experienced with mobile hardware and software architecture. Mr. James Gambale, right here. Thank you, James. And he's the, our last panelist is the president and CEO of One Spin Solutions. Please welcome Reich Brinkman. Thank you, Jim. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Appreciate you being here tonight. So this uh, panel grew out of a panel we actually did back in the middle of the summer in Austin, Texas at a design automation conference. And we wanted to expose that audience to ideas around AI and uh, machine learning convoluted networks. And it surprised us, right, uh, that we got through the presentation, did the questions, and people just wouldn't leave. You know, it was like 90 minutes. So I know better. No, people didn't come to see me, that's for sure. So they, they came because they have an interest and a, uh, a curiosity about the subject matter. And the subject matter is hard to get your head around because there's a lot of noise going on, right? And so it was back then that we actually conceived, that was the beginning of this uh, intellect, excuse me, Industrial Revolution 4.0 series that we've been running for the last few months here at San Jose State. Uh, thank you to the university for letting us do it. So tonight, 
what I like to do is not try to solve every question in the universe, but at least expose you to these gentlemen and uh, uh, to uh, get an idea of what practitioners in the art are doing now. Maybe get your interest. You know, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. Uh, a lot of you want to talk after the pitch. Be happy to do that as well. So uh, I'd like to move on and we'll go from Chris to Drew to James to Reich. And there's a there's a uh, order that's implied in that because Chris has uh, been a practitioner for a long time. He's got his own venture firm. He's got his own company that he started recently that he may talk about. And uh, also, you know, if you look at the history of tent look, it was one of the first uh, uh, solutions out there that was dealing with a lot of the image technology. So, without further ado, Mr. Rowan, would you please start? Right. Thank you very much. Uh, so. I'm going to take a perspective here of thinking about some of the broad impacts of this class of technology on key applications and even on the structure of the technology that we're creating. Um, Drew, I think, is going to do a little bit more of uh, an interesting uh, exploration down into the underlying technology. So our two talks in particular are sort of a pair. Uh, and hopefully together we'll give you something about, about how it works and something about what its uh, technical and business impact will be. So the place that I think is really interesting to start is to think about cameras, to think about image sensors. And in fact, we know that the rate of shipment of new image sensors is really spectacular. And we can therefore, assuming say a three year lifetime for an image sensor, for a camera in the field, we can look at the population of cameras versus the population of people. Now you might say, well, what does that matter? Well, it matters because the old conventional view of what cameras were for is that they were to capture pictures that people looked at. So, if you get a lot more cameras than you have people, it begs the question, who's looking at the pictures? What are those pictures for? And we see that we've just hit a magic crossover point where we really now have significantly more cameras than people. So if all our cameras were on and all of our people were looking at the output of those cameras 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, they could not keep up. So we really have to think about what happens when we have to do something to filter all that down to find the useful stuff. And that's really a, an important theme here. It's also worth noting that of all data that we capture from the natural world, virtually all of it is pixels. Uh, motion sensors are important, microphones are important, you know, humidity and temperature sensors are important, but all of them are very low data rate or very low volume compared to image sensors. And so 99% of all new data that we're capturing is pixels. And so it has a profound effect on what is the shape of computing, what is the shape of storage, what is the shape of networks. And just to give you a little bit of a challenge here, if you take the assumption that these are high resolution cameras and that they're on all the time, that means that you're capturing something like 10 to the 19th pixels per second. And that's far more than any network we can build or any storage medium we can build. One, another way to look at it is to say, okay, well, what does that mean economically? And I recently looked on Amazon for the cheapest camera, the cheapest complete camera system I could buy, which turns out to be $11.99 for this nice little high resolution security camera with power supply and electronics and network interconnection and, um, and even uh, infrared uh, lighting. Uh, and free shipping. <laughs> free shipping with Prime. <laughs> And it, and it sort of allows you to start thinking about, well, if that's what the camera costs, what does everything else have to cost to make that make sense? 
And, and I think what we find is that we are going to see not just what we do with images, but because images are so important, everything about the cost structure, the technical structure of networks and computing and storage will be shaped more than any other single force by the needs of cameras. And one thing at the very heart of what we're going to do with it is apply these more and more intelligent uh, uh, algorithms in order to interpret the data on behalf of the humans because either we need to get the cameras to be smarter or we have to make a lot more babies. <laughs> so we can ask the question, where does computing happen? And we have, in fact, lots of choices. If we think about some set of, of uh, monitoring cameras out in the real world, we could say, oh, well, we're going to capture those images and we're going to do the processing, possibly some sort of neural network that will find interesting events taking place right in the camera. Or we could uh, have that computing taking place somewhere upstream in a, in a local network. It may be happening across the, the wireless and fiber and DSL channels in some cloud edge serving. Or it may be happening all the way up in the cloud. And there are very important trade-offs taking place between these two ends of the spectrum. Because the cloud is very flexible. You have infinite amounts of computing capacity theoretically available. You have lots of storage. It's a very convenient place to merge together the data from many different sources. But it's actually very expensive. Uh, and if you add up the costs of storing there, of transporting all those pixels up there, it's prohibitively expensive to consider taking all the pixels and putting them in the cloud, at least from all these $12 cameras. Uh, and so, in fact, what we're going to find is we have to make some very smart choices. And these are not just technical choices, not just economic choices, but these are social choices as well as to what happens where. So. Uh, the question of system responsiveness. Generally, making the decisions close to the camera is a good thing. If you're driving your car, you do not want to be waiting for AT&T to decide that you can stop. The scope of data analysis, on the other hand, gets much better as you move uh, towards the cloud. Protection of privacy is generally best if you don't let most of the pixels out. If you just get the necessary information only being shared uh, up into the cloud. And the costs are dramatically affected. That when you look at what the cost of a unit computing, of computing is, if you do it in a specialized uh, system on chip device close to the camera versus doing it on some GPU or CPU in the cloud, you're talking about a couple of orders of magnitude of cost difference and power difference and carbon footprint difference and everything else. So one of the things that happens is that um, this move towards neural networks has made everybody in the hardware business extremely excited. It really is a fundamental technical discontinuity in computer architecture because we've taken a whole wide variety of different kinds of algorithms that need a very wide variety of different uh, computing models and replaced them with a computing model that basically says, if you can do a lot of multiplies and adds in parallel, you win. And so a whole new uh, class of computer architectures is emerging. And in this little graphic here, I look at many of the choices plotted on a horizontal axis, which is computing capacity per chip, and a vertical axis which is energy efficiency, um, all, both of them representing in billions of multiplies uh, per second, or in the vertical axis, billions of multiplies per second per watt. And what you find is if you track out what's happening, everybody is moving up and to the right. Uh, but we see the data center GPUs from NVIDIA, who have been extremely successful and extremely dedicated to this segment over the last few years. You have new kinds of architectures from new players like Google, uh, who really understand this problem well, introducing new platforms. 
And then you have the evolution of highly efficient architectures like vision DSPs to be even more efficient in this specialized class. So that um, the state-of-the-art solutions are dancing around a trillion multiplies per watt. And that's more than two orders of magnitude more efficient than what we have of our general purpose x86 uh, processors. And that two orders of magnitude is a pretty big deal. Uh, and it's really going to change the landscape. And we're going to see this kind of computing, perhaps as special purpose subsystems, entering into almost every kind of computing platform, from small chips down in security cameras up through the largest cloud servers, and certainly um, occupying your cell phone in a significant way. There's even people working on some really interesting low precision analog methods to do the same thing. And so my particular interest over the last couple of years has been on startups, both because I've done startups, but because I think it is one of the fundamental en engines of innovation, not just in technology, but in business models and use models and impact on society. Uh, and there are a lot of AI startups. In fact, um, it's a basic intelligence test for startups. If you have any way that you could possibly call your company an AI startup, you should. And everybody did, regardless of what they're actually doing, other than they probably are processing a bunch of data in some way. And so there's a lot of sorting out to do, because if the best working definition of an AI startup is founded since 2014. <laughs> but within that... Close 2015. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but within that, you find there actually is 5 or 10% of them that are doing something serious with neural networks. And we can break those down in lots of different ways. And it becomes a very interesting way to understand where innovation is really taking place. And so some really basic statistics here. Two-thirds of these startups are uh, in the cloud, uh, one-third doing embedded systems. Half of them are doing vision. Only a small fraction are doing new chips, but the 15 or 20 companies doing new chips around the world, and a lot of them actually here in, of all places, Silicon Valley, um, uh, represent a big step function in terms of chip startup activity compared to what we've seen uh, if you look back just three or four years. So that's kind of encouraging. It's also really interesting to look at it geographically. Um, this is an area, for example, where China is quite active, but by no means dominant. You know, there are, by my measures, significantly more uh, deep learning startups in Israel than in China today. There are more in the UK than in China today. And there are far more in the US. Uh, so that this isn't one of those things that's, that's sort of fulfilling um, some of the worries that we've, we've long had. Um, there's lots of good work happening in China, but also in a lot of places around the world. And so it is a truly global phenomenon, and it's one where this kind of uh, technology disruption really is putting us in a position to do, uh, to expect a lot of deep innovation. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Yeah, to give you an idea, you know, as Chris was saying, uh, you know, there's a lot of startups going right now. We'll get to this in the question period. Uh, so many have tried and put it on, but what, 5%, something like that, or actually probably meet the test yeah. whether they actually do it. So in terms of innovation, at least from my perspective, uh, those are the ones I want to try to find and, and foster. We'll talk a little bit about more in the, uh, the question and answer. So Drew, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts, my young friend. Well, thank you very much. Um, I am, as Chris mentioned, going to try to dovetail on his presentation a bit and take it a little bit more into the technology, only because I, I think it's interesting. And secondly, I think maybe it'll help you um, better understand some of the trade-offs that are going on out there. So there's a, a pretty famous diagram that if you start to get into this space, you will no doubt see that was um, published by someone at the Asimov Institute that tries to summarize all the different commonly described topologies for neural networks. And it turns out there's a, a really large number of them. Um, 
I, I won't pretend to, I won't go into this. I don't understand them all. Um, I'm not even sure I understand what all the colored dots mean. But, but what, what I think you can see pretty quickly is um, these all have a relatively similar shape. You see these circles and they're connected by these lines, right? There's a, there's a network effect that's, that's built into them. Um, there's a couple of really interesting things about this. Um, one of them is, for a lot of these topologies, we know much more about how they actually work than why they work. And so when you hear terms like data scientist being thrown around, that has a lot to do with the people who have the intuition that say, if I'm trying to solve a given problem with a neural network, which one of these topologies should I pick? And, and please understand, yeah, there's a do large number of ver variations in exactly how you apply one of these. And the number of layers between you know, uh, the yellow and the purple and the green and okay. um, can vary quite a lot based upon the data set. So yeah. the one up here that I'm highlighting is the one that we call the convolution, convolutional neural um, which is, you know, kind of one of the focuses of the panel today. It's largely because that one has been shown to do some very interesting things, especially with image data like what Chris just talked about. So if we take a look at that one in a little more depth, what we find out is there is a lot of math in making one of these work. And that's kind of interesting because, you know, people who've got a background in computers are used to trying to balance things like uh, decision. So the if statement in most of our programming languages and things, and, and these don't really look that way. Um, it really is a lot more math. So if we take a look at one of those circles here, um, that represents the neurons, because we are talking about you know, cognitive computing. It's kind of biology inspired. And so we're trying to you know, mimic in some way, some fashion, what we think goes on in our brains. And really the mathematical operation that haps, happens inside of those is fundamentally a weighted sum. You take a look at the layer before you, and you take the values that are output from that layer, you multiply them by a set of weights, and each one of the weights is specific to each one of the arcs. You come up with a sum, that's, where, that's, that's the closest thing we get to an equation here, probably the closest thing we get to an equation in the entire series of lectures, which I think is a good thing. Um, it's a Greek letter. Exactly, the, the big sigma. Um, it's a fraternity. And then depending upon how you're doing this, you take that sum and you come up with an output value and that's the activation function. And then people argue and have lots of different you know, ideas about how you do it, but typically they end up being nonlinear. So as we look at the ones that we use for things like image processing, like Chris talked about, they're much deeper than this and the order of each of the layers is much larger. Yeah, they end up being not just, those look like one-dimensional layers, each one of the columns there, they end up being multi-dimensional layers. And so the total number of nodes it takes to get one output is very large. And if you think about each one of the inputs ideally being connected to each one of the guys in the prior layer, you find out the total number of uh, weights is massive. And so if you think about that mathematical operation, the weighted sum it is a set of multiplies followed by a set of adds. That's this famous um, operation that is how we've characterized digital signal processors for, for many years, that the multiply accumulate. And when Chris talks about having trillions of multiply accumulates per um, watt, that's what we need. So, and they can, these networks can absorb as many of those as you can throw at it. Now there's a bunch of optimizations for people trying to apply because the energy and the amount of hardware it takes to process one of these networks can be really large very quickly. So one of the things they play with is how precise is the arithmetic. We started off using you know, general purpose computers and we used floating point numbers with a large number of bits of precision. And the people started doing analysis and say they could use much, much less. There's actually plenty of research work that try to use one bit values. You know, um, We also recognize that when you, by the time you're done going through the process that's called training of the network, a lot of times, a lot of the arcs have a very, very small weight on them. You can replace that by multiplying with zero, and I know how to multiply by zero. It's a really easy thing. And so you can build structures and take advantage of the fact that the networks, uh, while the, ideally they're fully connected, they don't necessarily need to be, and so they can be sparse. And then as Chris mentioned, the sum of products function is relatively expensive in the digital domain. 
but if your precision doesn't have to be very high, it can be implemented much less expensively in the analog domain, it turns out. And so there are plenty of people that are looking at interesting approaches there. Well, and the currency is power, for example. That's right. If you're trying to get a certain amount of work done on a certain budget, sometimes the analog domain can be the right way to go. So as a result of that, people have tried a whole lot of different ways to go. Uh, maybe the most famous early work here was the, the chips that IBM built, including the very famous True North design, which where they were really trying to more closely mimic the behavior of the brain. And they built a chip with our government's funding that um, you know, implemented a million neurons and 256 million synapses, connections between neurons. Um, the most commonly deployed technology in this space right now are uh, general purpose uh, graphics processing units, like the one that NVIDIA just came out with. Uh, I think the most recent one is the Volta V100, um, which has a set of dedicated cores they've now added in to make this type of multiply accumulate more efficient. Um, and this one is, is quite good at both the, the step of actually coming up with answers to neural network problems, which we call inference, or the steps to try to decide exactly what weights to put into our neural network, which we call inference. Training. Chart training, thank you. Good Lord. Uh, Chris also mentioned this, this interesting design that, that Google did, um, the first design they did, which I think they talked about last year. Um, they call the Tensor Processing Unit, or TPU. Um, it is really a machine that is really, 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 really focused on doing matrix multiplies. Uh, most of the uh, most of the area on the chip is both is a, a big parallel multiply accumulator array. Um, they can do sixty four thousand multiply accumulates per cycle, which is a pretty darn big number. But because of some of the limitations in the design, it was much more focused on inference and wasn't very good at training. And then another design I know a bit about is a, a startup company in Campbell called Wave, who um, took a data a, a data flow processor architecture that they had and adapted it to um, this space. So they've got a design that has you know, 16,000 8-bit processing elements all connected in a, in a hierarchical network approach um, that they've applied with a massive amount of memory bandwidth. If you look at these four designs, they could not be more different. And what that says to me is it's a very rich space right now for the exploration of architectures. But there's a bunch of limit, implementation limitations. So first of all, as, as Chris notes, the type of system you might want to build and therefore the type of chips you might want to deploy may depend upon where in the network you're trying to do the computing. Um, another big question is what types of services are you want to provide with your neural network? Right now, inference is everything. Being able to process those images right now with a network that somebody else trained is the way it needs to go. But as we look at the expectations that people have for what, where things are going to go, it appears that there are a number of interesting applications where being able to update our weights in real time based upon what we see at this specific node becomes much more interesting. And so it looks like architectures that support some amount of continuous updating will be more important. These weights end up being a big barrier um, so we have problems with um, where we keep the weights. If we keep them on chip, then we can't have very many of them because we run out of storage space. If we try to keep them all off chip, well then we have run into energy problems and just fundamental bandwidth problems of getting them onto and off the chip on time. Um, and then so what some people do is apply techniques that we use in general purpose software all the time, like you take a, a, a series of computations and you unroll the loop so that you can batch things up. And that, that's a good way of reducing the amount of bandwidth you need for weights, but that increases the overall latency. And then there's this overall question in this space of how do you manage the overall communications. Um, and the communications that you need are dependent upon the structure of the network you're building, and if people keep coming up with clever new ways of doing this, the data scientists keep coming up with new network topologies and new ways of hooking things up, then you may need more flexibility in the communication system than you might have immediately imagined. Thanks, Drew. Well, this is going to be the transition. Uh, we just talked about the possible architectures, uh, the importance of weighting information on models, for example, the fact that you have sparse matrices that need a lot of compute power, and 
uh, we're going to shift a little bit, and purposely we have James going next. James is you know, a good friend of mine, and uh, somebody who's taught me a lot about this. Just, just so happens he's a lawyer, and don't hold that against him, please. But uh, I wanted, I asked James to kind of give us some thought about the problems we're going to have, just not from a technical standpoint, but also sort of what are we walking into? What kind of hornet's nest are we going to see once we get to the other side? And um, and then Wright's going to follow it up with that, says, yeah, well, how do we manage to keep track of everything James is talking about and ensure that we don't, you know, run a car into some uh, a school bus? Sorry, I had to come up with an image that wasn't too bad. But anyway, so James, kick her up. So I, I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about the value proposition for a cognitive science department here at SJSU. And I think it's important to um, think about the roles that a multidisciplinary department can uh, uh, play in contributing to thinking about uh, this space. And, and, and so, you know, if you think about it, it, it's not limited to these four silos. There's many, many different uh, departments uh, here at the university that uh, will contribute in this space. Engineering, of course, we, we've seen the technical, the highly uh, detailed nature of these uh, hardware devices that are designed to, to uh, do neural net processing, and um, the complexity involved is, is, is pretty significant. So it, it, it's important to think about, well, how do non-engineers contribute in this space? What's the role of philosophy and psychology and business and, and the other uh, departments in a cognitive science uh, program? So I, 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 I decided to address the, that problem by giving two examples and talking to uh, two different faculty members here at the university who are involved in um, thinking about problems uh, that, that actually turn out to have relevance in this space. So uh, the, uh, uh, the first person I talked to is Dr. Evan Palmer. He's doing some uh, very interesting uh, research here uh, uh, invo involving cognitive psychology and gamification. And um, it, it might, I, I, I talked to Evan and, 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 and we actually agreed that uh, this research could have application to neural network training. We'll, we'll talk about that for a moment. And then I, I talked to uh, Dr. Uh, Daniel Susser from uh, the philosophy department, and we had a, a very interesting discussion about accountability of machine learning decisions and who should be responsible in issues like accountability versus transparency. And the point of all of this is there are a lot of folks here at the university. Well, how do you depose a machine? So, anyway. Sorry, yeah, that may happen someday. I know. I'm waiting. So, so, so let, let, let's get let's go through this. Let's talk a little bit about um, some some work that's being done here at the psychology uh, department. Uh, gamification is a way of using game-like elements in non-game situations to make uh, people perform certain tasks better. For example. Uh, uh, People who uh, are scanning, X, looking at x-rays at the airport to scan baggage, or uh, technicians who are looking uh, at radiological images to try and detect uh, disease. Uh, what, what Dr. Palmer is doing is he's applying uh, game-like elements to uh, determine whether or not uh, these tasks can be performed uh, better in some way. And so it, it, it actually occurred uh, to me, and, and, and by talking uh, to Dr. Palmer, that you know this is not that different than what um, is going on with training systems of neural nets, most notably uh, uh, Google's AlphaGo, which has a training scheme involving multiple uh, neural nets. Uh, and uh, what... Uh, Um, there we go. Now I'm back. Um, it's alive. Yes. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, it, it, this is not meant to be a, a, a detailed, uh, substantive example, but it, but it, but clearly there is a role 
for non-engineers uh, in departments uh, like the psychology department to play in the, in the cognitive science department. And I think um, this is a great example where research that's not directed directly at uh, the details of the hardware or um, the details of the network topology, perhaps, uh, could potentially be applied uh, to make neural nets or help neural nets think more like humans, which really has turned out to be the key to making some of these systems of neural networks like AlphaGo perform more like humans and perform uh, their tasks uh, much, much better than uh, if we were just thinking about the math alone. Um, another, another way that I think uh, the non-engineering departments uh, can contribute is, is, is thinking about issues of ethics and policy and technical policy. And, and so I talked to uh, Dr. Daniel Susser from the Department of Philosophy. And I uh, had uh, recently seen uh, an article in the Wall Street Journal, I, may, maybe other folks have, have seen it, published last month. Um, it was, was written by a, a, an early uh, pioneer uh, in, in, in the neural net space, uh, Kurt Levy. He was with a, a startup in the 90s, HNC Software, that did a bunch of very early machine learning systems that are fundamental to uh, fraud detection. And it, the, the, the gist of the article is that we, we, we need to think about how we're going to explain decisions that are made by these emerging machine learning systems. Why do machine learning systems reach a particular uh, decision? And you, you get into these issues of opacity. Is it, how, how do we, not only how do we explain, is it even possible to understand uh, the decisions that these networks are making by analyzing the weights alone? Or, you know, even going further, the network topology, the code, the trading data development, the methodologies, these all may affect the decisions. So in, in the Levy article in the Wall Street Journal, um, there, the, the issue was accountability versus transparency. Tra is tra when you start thinking about the policy around analyzing the decisions that are made by these neural nets, um, in, in the case where something might go wrong, is, is, is transparency enough? Or rather, do we need to have uh, other standards or mechanisms uh, or technical solutions to provide for accountability? Um, accountability, perhaps, might, may mitigate the insufficiency of transparency. We, you, you may not be able to understand precisely why a neural net is making a particular decision by looking at the weights or the topology or the code, but maybe by developing certain factors, for example, explainability to ensure that non-technical reasons can be given for why an artificial intelligence model reached a particular decision, or developing confidence measures that communicate the certainty that a given decision is accurate, uh, uh, procedural regularity means the artificial intelligence system decision-making process is applied in the same manner every time. And then thinking about responsibility to ensure that when something goes wrong, um, there's appropriate means uh, for the, those adversely affected to have a recourse. And, and so, it, you know, this is really going to be a very important area. And, you know, having a, a, a active involvement from the philosophy department or you know, many, many folks across the spectrum here at the university is going to be very important. And I just wanted to highlight some of the thoughts uh, in, in the conversation with uh, Dr. Susser that I think are, are very, very uh, interesting with respect to uh, the non-technical uh, analysis of, of, of some of these emerging um, issues. Um, you know, one, one issue is, do technical solutions that provide accountability eliminate the need for transparency? In other words, can we, can we come up with a way to explain the decisions and eliminate the need to look inside the network? Um, a related kind of corollary is, is it even possible for technical solutions to keep pace with the increasing complexity of these machine learning systems? Um, the devices that Drew was describing 
are only going to get more powerful and the networks are going to become more complicated and the weights and the data is go it's going to continue to increase. So what does that mean for our ability to explain the decisions that these systems are arriving at? Um, some important questions posed by Dr. Susser, who, who are uh, the machine learning algorithms being explained to? Does, do we need someone like Drew and Chris to understand uh, exactly what the explanations mean, or can that even be communicated to policymakers and decision makers effectively? Um, which aspects of automated decision making are being audited in the explanations? Is it simply a function of the weights and the different variables as suggested in the Levy article, or um, is there some kind of bias in the training set uh, that is affecting the decision making? Um, who is responsible for problems? These are all complex questions, and um, we're not going to answer them here today. And again, I, I think uh, you can kind of see what's involved here and why you need a robust uh, um, uh, university with a multidisciplinary team to address uh, some really, really challenging questions. Thanks, James. You know, uh, so this is a great transition. Reich's company uh, is involved in formal verification. Formal verification is a method sure, that we have uh, uh, coverage. And where they are successful in particular is uh, it's a Munich-based company. No accent there that they're very successful in you know, the autonomous car world, the safety world. So it'd be great to hear from Wright and hear his thoughts about where we're going on the, the insuring and auditing this. Please, Wright. So thanks. Um, what I want to do is I want to uh, bring the discussion into a particular context and um, try to uh, take the convolution of neural networks in its prime application, which is um, computer vision and decision making, uh, plus um, some safety critical aspects in autonomous vehicles and try to understand and, and look at a few questions of uh, what it means. And as we have heard before, it's um, you're doing a good job in understanding how these artificial neural networks work. We can explain the debates and the, the mechanics behind it. Um, we can do a great job on verifying the mechanics of it, at least to small scale parts of the designs. Um, we have some issues maybe verifying the connectivity and all the interconnects, but that's something that we can solve. But that's not explaining how things work. Um, it doesn't explain why. And, um, Verification is basically, for us, is the question of uh, providing a convincing argument um, why things don't go wrong for a wide range of um, scenarios. So it's not just the question whether it works for the cases you have studied, whether your training set is uh, good enough, um, whether your test set is performing uh, well. Um, that's only one, one aspect to it. And um, even for this, it's hard to say why it works. There is more to it. There's other questions um, that you need to look at if you bring these uh, systems into a safety critical context. One is, for example, they are pretty hard to train, but they are easy to break. There's quite a few examples where you can easily manipulate images and uh, you will see that the network will come to some really interesting uh, conclusions. And I put one here that is a uh, study from, um, that was um, published in IEEE where uh, people have put some markers on um, some stop signs and it would actually uh, let the neural network drive um, that this is a 45 mile per hour street sign instead of a stop sign, which is not really something you want to have in practice, I believe. Um, the second point that you may look into although, is... Although I know people that practice that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard to defend. Um, that means when we, when we look at um, machine learning applications compared to more standard ways of engineering, um, if you look at how people build cars and, and things like that before, you could go back to the engineer and ask him, why do you believe your system works? Explain it to me. Um, what did you consider? What can go wrong? You cannot ask the neural network to do that. It's not explaining itself. And um, that means it's not interpretable. Just like Trump. Yes, it's a bit like, um, 
yeah, he may be a neural network in some way, and um, <laughs> pattern matching and giving some answers to... There may be some neural in there. Sorry, <laughs> neural. I wouldn't say... Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, at least quite a few of them. Um, so the causality of the models is the big question here. Um, so you cannot actually audit the decision trail. You cannot say why a certain decision was made by the network. It's, today it's not possible. There is no theory behind that that we can use in order to answer this question. And um, also because of the complexity, um, bugs in the operating process are also difficult to find. That's something UE can work on, but it's not solving a whole problem. And there's even more to it. I, I call it um, what I picked up um, from the uh, from the uh, literature, the recent uh, studies, it's um, the uncertain uncertainty. It's about you don't know what you don't know. It's um, the fact that the training uh, takes place on the decision you make. It's the training set you put in. And it will only be answering questions that are similar to the training set you have considered. You can make a risk analysis on the training set. You, can, you know the probability distribution maybe for a certain amount of parameters. But you don't know that for all the parameters because you might not know all the parameters that are relevant in the system. So there's a, an uncertain risk here. You cannot actually measure that and you cannot uh, take precautions other than trying to understand the environment uh, as closely as you can, trying to model all the different ways um, the system might be, might be used or the situations it might be exposed to. There was one study that I saw that said, hey, we should actually make a collection of all the different scenarios that um, autonomous vehicles get into, including the car driving on a motorway close to the close to the sea and a tsunami is hitting the coast. There was one video of a poor guy who actually survived the tsunami in um, in Japan, making a really interesting and, and very successful decision on how he was maneuvering his car. Uh, and survived the blast because he was actually seeing the situation, making the best for him, and um, could get away. There is no way an AV would do that if it hasn't been exposed to the situation before. Obviously, this is maybe something that you say, okay, maybe this is a really rare case. But who's telling your systems engineers what cases to consider? What's the auditation? Uh, well, how do you how do you find out? Um, and last but not least, it's a really complex problem because there are so many interdependent subsystems that um, it's pretty hard to get the connection between all of them and make a full verification for this. So it is um, said that on a theoretical side, no one knows where they're defending against some adversary examples. This was the first case. It's actually theoretically possible or hopeless. So we are really in the early days of understanding the um, impact of, of this technology. And um, what it means is if we want to apply it, we need to at least find some good practices of how we, how we tackle this. And there are some um, interesting ideas of how we can do that. The main point that I wanted to make was the uncertain uncertainty is uh, the training data forms the requirements. This is a data driven thing. It's not an um, in engineering science that we have done so far. So the spec bugs is, are the ones that kill you. It's the things that were omitted in the training set that actually will cause fatalities in the end. It's not the thing, I, I believe that we can make these things work on the things that we, that we know, but the things that we don't know are, are the problems. So um, one way to do it is to insist on models that can be interpreted by people. That was going into the question of accountability. So we need to uh, find ways of, do that, of doing it. Um, as a practitioner for machine learning, you may want to exclude features from your training set um, where you don't know how they relate to the outcome. Just don't do it, because if it's in some unknown way related to what you want to do, you may not want to do it because you don't control it. Um, there's um, failures uh, of these networks that you might be able to detect or when your network is um, less confident in the predictions, you may want to actually put some precautions in the system. Um, you can also um, look at the cycle that I put here on the right 
how car manufacturers want to uh, learn from the experience in the field. The verification becomes uh, implicative for the whole cycle. It's no longer just um, designing the system, verifying the system, deploying the system. Because the data is getting feedback into the system from the field, you need to have the verification in the loop all the time. So you need to re-verify the whole models, you need to recertify what it's doing every time you deploy that, otherwise you run the risk of data spoofing, as I mentioned on my first slide, and other things. So, um, last but not least, it's a systems uh, verification question, and um, you need to have interdisciplinary um, views on this. It's not uh, sufficient to just ask the machine learning guy to come up with a verification. Um, and um, we need to employ a lot of non-machine learning methodologies in order to control this. So, as one of the last points here, um, someone um, made a comment that the AV verification is more complex and interdisciplinary than the chip verification industry. It's, um, and that's a complex one. If you're from Silicon Valley and you're in the, in the industry, you know what this means. It's, it's really a very, very difficult thing to talk. Yeah, thanks, right? <clears throat> Hopefully uh, what we gave you so far tonight was an uh, uh, overview of, you know, from the hardware through the sort of social issues and verification issues, and then, you know, what's a method that we can actually design these things. Now, uh, I think a common misconception is big data is often said in the same sentence as uh, neural nets and, and uh, machine learning. And, you know, I, we had a pretty nice discussion right before we came on. Uh, it's about the training data. You know, people got to know that data scientists have to know what they want because just turning a convoluted network on a, a big data set who knows if you get a result of all so Chris why don't I start you asking you what do you think about that comment by me yeah it's an interesting perspective because it's clear that having a lot of data big data is one of the prerequisites for uh, applying this class of, of algorithms in fact, a good way to think about all of neural networks and deep learning is that it is a statistical method, which is applicable in problems that have gotten so complicated that we don't know of any conventional algorithm to do a good job on them. And so we really use this learning method to get a, stati a good statistical guess, the best guess we possibly can get based on all of these examples about what the right answer is or the right behavior. So you need big data to do it, but the mere existence of masses of data isn't very useful because uh, the real purpose of the big data is to use those examples to train the system. And that means you not only need to have big data, but you have to know what the right answer is for all of those examples. And so there's a higher, there's a higher standard or an additional need besides just having terabytes of data. You have to have useful data. Useful data or apply useful. Yeah, so what, a quick comment on what Chris just said. You know, we, in uh, semiconductor manufacturing, it's a continuous process, so more akin to the pharmaceutical industry than building a car. So it's statistically driven, and we used to operate in like this three sigma range, and in terms of distribution, I thought we were geniuses. So, but you know, with the smaller, smaller geometries, the variance is so high that you have to be in sig seven sigma range. So back to statistics for a second. We don't have enough time to run the statistics. So what the machine learning's allowed us to do is reduce that time and, and hopefully find that variance. So along those lines, I'm the investor, Chris is as well, but and I'm the investor tonight. And, uh, and so, uh, one of my companies just exited uh, Friday, and it was all about getting to the sigma, seven sigma distributions, and we did that through AI techniques. So, so when I hear these guys talk, I, you can just imagine that I'm thinking company, 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 right? <laughs> Drew, what do you think about training data? How hard is it? How important, you know, like for example, Wave, one of the companies you illustrated, getting training data for those guys must be really hard. Okay, well, so a company like Wave's trying to sell the computing solution part, so they don't need the, it's their customers who need the training data, but as Chris mentioned, the, 
the data by itself isn't valuable until the, as he said, the answer has been plagued. Now, for a lot of data sets, that is often called labeling. And to label a data set is actually an awful lot of work. And so one place is where people might apply the gamification strategies that uh, James was talking about is in trying to incentivize people to go through data sets as humans and label them. So, you know, that's like in some of the famous image sets, oh, that's a cat, that's a dog, you know, this is a stop sign. That's cancer, that's not. Right. And so um, the quality of that labeling is incredibly important to the success of the training process. Um, the training process itself is, is complex. The, the math that I showed was the inference math. But the, the mathematics and the communication associated with actually training involves you know, trying to calculate, OK, I, I ran this training data set through my network, and I didn't get the answers I wanted. Now what do I do? And then there's a whole lot of different kinds of math and, and communications that go on in trying to come up with what's the best way to update my weights so that the next time I push something through, it has a reasonable chance of getting better. Or you can multiply by zero. <laughs> so uh, now let's see how comfortable James is with this question. So, uh, so we have this training data. It's got value, commercial value, right? Actually, the training data is IP. I don't want to give my IP up to anybody, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that's really kind of the central issue, I think, that's posed by the, the Levy article uh, that was in the Wall Street Journal. I mean, he, he's suggesting that we can circumvent that issue and, and, and not disclose the training data, not disclose the weights, because we can develop technical measures of accountability. And, the you know, the, the philosophical question and the, and, the, and the thing for the technical ethicists and the lawyers to straighten out is can, accountability versus uh, transparency. Is, is accountability alone enough or, or, or do we have to open up the black box and uh, disclose its contents in order to uh, uh, develop the you know, technical policies around how accountability is going to be developed for these networks. It's, it's, it's yeah. A, yeah, for me, it's standard cell business all over again kind of thing. And, and so, yeah, I can see a commercial um, offering at some point. I want to chime in with just one additional thought associated with training databases. And that is, not only are they valuable, but they p potentially uh, capture bias of one sort or another. And it's pretty hard to look at, say, yeah. a million photos and say, is there something wrong with the statistical distribution here? Have I overrepresented, you know, uh, Cocker, no Spaniels. Cocker Spaniels over uh, Norwegian uh, elk hounds? <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of hard to tell just by, look, by glancing at it. And in, in more profound ways, we actually need to think about the robustness of our systems as being bias-free, whatever that means. Yeah. But it means something yeah. to, in order to be able to uh, use these systems effectively. Yeah, so I think that's a great lead in for Frank, actually. Well, um, I want to latch on that question about the, the data and where it comes from, and that it's actually the, the gold of, of the next machine age. Um, it will actually uh, be probably one reason why people want to push computing to the edge because if you control the data and you, you actually do the computation on it and you learn from it and you control the whole flow and it's part of your IP, it's part of your system, you're not gonna, you don't need to give it up. It doesn't go to the cloud. No one else needs to know what it's, what it's doing so you can protect your IP. If you can get away with accountability, then, then this is going to be um, a really good thing for people doing that. But if, it's, if it needs to be transparent, um, that is going to be a challenge, and it goes the other way around. Um, if you have these um, uh, trade-offs that we have heard of um, about uh, the data density and um, the storage that you need, how do you put the, um, any form of transparency in place if um, you have so much data? It's probably not going to work. So it <laughs> actually makes it even even worse. Let's see if I yeah. There's the mic. Hey, can I invite Sean to come back up? And uh, I'm looking. Yeah, we're uh, we're about 50 minutes into the uh, hour, and I'd like to uh, 
get Sean to help me out, uh, invite questions from the audience if possible. Yeah. So we have uh, one mic set up in the back here. Don't shout your, your questions from, uh, from your chair. Just feel free to line up and uh, um, ask a question. Uh, I have one for, for James. I don't know if this was discussed earlier, but what about computers as inventors? In other words, what are the legal and policy implications of a computer actually being an inventor? Yeah, that's, that, that, I don't think we have law on that yet. I, I, okay. I, I, I haven't researched uh, any case law on that specifically, but I, I, I think um, it would require a modification of uh, this, the, the U.S. code to, uh, you know, only people can be inventors at this point. So um, I think to the extent that a piece of AI came up with an idea and that piece of AI was developed by a person, it would it would likely be the case that the the person would be considered the uh, okay. yeah. that that makes sense. I mean, otherwise we sort of said, well, my pencil invented it. I did. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe cyborgs. <laughs> Any questions from the looks like Graham's ready? Graham, do you have a uh, question? No, Sam can go first. Oh, Sam. Sure. Uh, this question is uh, this question is for Chris. Well, you need to turn that on. Oh. The, the mic out, out in the audience is not working, fellas. Here's the switch right on the... Uh... Could you the help him out there? Tech support's coming. Oh. Yeah, there he is. Nice <laughs> ringtone. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so this question is for Chris. Uh, what do you think is the role of uh, open source processor uh, like RISC-V is in AI? That's a good question. Um, two thoughts. I mean, one, I think there is this open source movement, which is touching many, many different st uh, areas of intellectual development. Um, I think it is most profound in software and most likely to be successful because if you, you can replace a piece of open source software relatively easily if you find it isn't everything it was meant to be. Um, open source so far has played a very minor role in hardware, partly because um, uh, it's really the case that things like processors are such essential technology that people want, you know, a robust architecture with great support. And heretofore, there have not been open open source solutions that have really good support. Now RISC-V does seem to be a departure in that it, it appears that there may be enough of a critical mass in the ecosystem to have it survive. On the other hand, the RISC-V architecture is more like that Intel x86 at the bottom of the chart than any of the other architectures that is shown there. And that these new architectures, which are extremely parallel machines, um, are going to be the ones that do essentially all of the evaluation for inference and do all of the, the training. And conventional RISC or CISC architectures are really going to be you know, supervisors on the side. So I think open source is becoming relevant, but there's nothing about this revolution that particularly favors Intel versus ARM versus uh, sci-fi architectures. It's, they're really next thing to being irrelevant to this computational revolution. A couple things on RISC-V. The RISC-V uh, uh, event was last week in Milpitas, and uh, WD's gonna use it, and their systems make sense from a WD standpoint because they're gonna integrate a whole lot of companies. So it cleans up their integration path. But as Chris says, it's for control, right? The computational engine is this big, massive parallel processing unit. Think that's there's a reason Nvidia is good at this because they've been moving a lot of pixels for a long time. So we're going to see something on the order, I believe, of application processors that are working in tandem with control stuff. So that might be a good segue, Drew. What do you think? 
Well, I mean, as Chris said, the, I think the reason that open source, when open source works, it typically works because you get a, a network effect, different kind of network, but you get a network effect, you get a, a critical mass of people who are willing to contribute and care enough about the result that they themselves or their company allows them to invest some time for the benefit of the community. And, and so the, the whole is worth you know, more than the sum of the parts. Um, so that's been a you know a big challenge for hardware type structures because typically semiconductor companies don't like to let their engineers give their time away to such tasks. Um, you know people like to try to keep things to themselves, and um, when you're pushing really hard on numerical metrics like the number of things you can do per second, people get all excited about what they believe to be their competitive advantages. Um, in this space, as I, as you know, as Chris pointed out, and I tried to, you know, elaborate a bit on my slides, it really is all about a specific branch of math, and I, I see a very, very rich idea of places where universities could play, um, putting together, you know, ideas for technologies that, that potentially could be um, non-differentiating open technologies that people could use as accelerators in some of these systems. And, I, th I think that's a, a great area for you know academic research. James, what do you think about open source here? I, I think um, on the hardware, I, I, or, yeah, on the or hardware side. I mean, I, I think Risk Five um, could play an important role um, as a, a supporting technology. I, I mean, I. I, I tend to agree with uh, Drew's comments on the IP issues. I think to the extent that, you know, hardware companies have uh, technologies that confer a particular advantage in, in the neural net computation, training, arms race, they're going to want to keep those close to their vests. They're, they're, you know, they're going to want to file patents around these things, either as a protective or uh, a source of licensing revenue, and, and it, 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 that's problematic in the context of a risk five type model. Yeah, I mean, you know, we didn't disclose, uh, but you can Google James, and you'll see that he was uh, he worked for uh, Qualcomm down in San Diego, so he's well versed in this. Right. What do you think? You know, open source give you a big headache, buddy. Mm, open source hardware, um, I think not really, because um, as we discussed, um, the, the application companies for open source hardware are actually WD and other big companies, so it's not really the same yeah. um, environment as if you had this uh, open source software. And the other reason that I would like to add is that uh, potentially there's a difference between software and soft cores. Also. It's not really soft that we what we do in hardware I, IP. And um, there's also the, the cost for the hardware itself. So it's not like you have the NOE on the, on the software and then you have a community and it distributed and copied as many times as you want. There is a substantial cost in the hardware itself. So, and that's um, making a big part of the, of the cost for the system that you, that you open source. It's not going to come for free if, even though it's open. Yeah, free is never free. You know, a great example of that is uh, check out the market cap of uh, Red Hat. You know, was a, who supported Linux, and they're like a thirty billion dollar company for God's sakes. How'd that happen? So we got some more questions. Uh, hi, I, I had a, a question on the uh, social side. It seems like with all of these sensors that are available, I can capture all of my data, all of my experiences as a human being from birth onwards, including my biometric data. And um, it seems to me it's kind of like, almost like a privacy issue. Shouldn't I own all of the training data that can come from me as a human being? And shouldn't it be only as an opt-in that you can collect any kind of training data about me? And, um, Maybe there's a business model for managing people's personal data. I don't know, but it seems to me on a social level, uh, people should be able to have complete control over their data, or at least have complete visibility in what's happening with their data. Yeah, I think that's a really important distinction between visibility over and control over. Um, 
and I think it's always useful in these cases when we're talking about automatic data collection to substitute human data collection. So in society, in the absence of technology, do you have complete control over what everybody thinks of you? Other people are observing you and forming opinions about you, and, and, and you don't, you know, especially if you go and into public places. People are going to be sensing you, learning about you, training their brains about your behavior. And it seems implausible that we could say that we own everything that comes out of an interaction with other humans. However, I mean, clearly this is data collection on a massive scale and data collection with a possibility of reuse in purposes that we never had in mind. Um, but we need some practical ways to draw the line. I mean, today I think the law generally is, if you go do something on the public street, then you are, by actively going out in public, you're giving a kind of permission for other people in that public space to, to, to sense you. But what you do behind closed doors remain yours. But we have kind of this very crude separation. But we better ask the lawyer here. <laughs> I, I, I think that to the extent that you're interacting on a, a public street, as uh, Chris uh, uh, used in his example, is, and, and you're being sensed that you're not going to be able to control the use of what others learn about your, your interactions with others or things in the public space. But that, what about in the workplace? That, that, do I have do I have control over the biometric data that I'm emitting in my workplace? Yeah, that's a more complex question that would probably be governed by contract. I mean, it really you'd have to look at the contractual agreements between your employer. I mean, that could be something that's covered in an employment agreement. It might be an issue for an employment agreement in the future. And the disposition of that data and the ownership of that data is all something that would have to be straightened out via contract. They, you know, you have to contrast that private setting with all of us in, in a public setting. And I think, you know, the law is pretty well developed with respect to privacy issues uh, or your your lack of any clear right to privacy in, in a public setting. In 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 a workplace or a private setting, it's it's it depends. Well, only example I can give you that where uh, there's process or policy in place is on health records. So one of the companies I'm involved with is, uh, uh, has a contract with the Veterans Administration and we've automated the aggregation of their health data, which is it, it, useful because it's in disparate places, right, in different formats. So we get all that VA data into a, um, a big data set, we can start looking at trends for the veterans. Now, what you want to do is ensure, and what the law requires, by the way, there's laws, HIPAA laws on this, is that we don't ever reveal the patient themselves. We can talk about behavior, trends, things like that. So we got to really abstract the data. So I would argue that, at least in the case of the Veterans Administration and health records, there's thought and law there. Now, is, there, is that going to, the first place it's going to migrate to is the rest of us. So I think health data is probably the first place. I think it's really useful to also recognize that <clears throat> different parts of the world are wrestling with this very differently. You know, Europe has, it on a trend towards much greater protection of privacy, much greater assumption that people retain rights, and the other end of the spectrum may be China, where surveillance is... <laughs> everywhere. Everywhere. Uh, and, uh, you know, the idea that somebody's going to claim that their, you know, behavior on a public street is private information, I don't think it's going to play, you know, <laughs> terribly, terribly well. I think it might be important to think about who's collecting the data, too. I mean, think about your interactions in your vehicle, and you've got Waymo driving around sensing. I mean, are, is your behavior in your vehicle uh, and, and immune from capture? By, by, by those companies that want to understand driving behavior to build their autonomous vehicle systems. Who, I don't think so. I mean, I think that data is out there for everybody to collect. But yeah. distinguish that with perhaps the government trying to uh, collect uh, information about 
uh, the way you interact in your car. So I, I, I think you know who's collecting the data and what the purpose is. Um, th these are all very intertwined. Quite well, the well, the scientist in me, right? You know, let's talk cars for a second, right? So he was saying, give me the data set, give me all the uh, the assertions that I can plug into my verification system, and if I have a everybody's driving behavior, then I have a big uh, database that I can utilize to ensure I save lives. So who makes that decision? That's above my pay grade, right? But I, it seems to me, yeah, I'm not particularly happy with them knowing where I am all the time, although I never go anywhere because I'm an old guy, because you just sit home and, you know, Friday, Friday nights, Denny's, right? So I'm pretty predictable. <laughs> but, you know, Same I think uh, <laughs> the special... And uh, six nine six forty nine for anybody over you know fifty five, but uh, with that said, uh, I'm kind of okay with them taking all my data, that data, and plugging it into an autonomous thing. Right? What do you think? Well, I think as a European and the proponent of privacy, <laughs> I think it's one of the most important cornerstones of democracy and freedom, and it's um, you shouldn't give it up too lightly, um, and. In this particular case, um, going back to Graham's question, um, I think you may want to have some control over where the data goes that you produce. So it is the first stage that you talk about um, the cars um, collecting data about you, and there may be some reason for doing that in order to provide some service to you that you actually want. Now, um, leaving the government outside and the Chinese government in particular, um, it is then the question, where does that data go from there? And who is collecting data from multiple sources? And um, Jim, your, your health insurance might still go up because people are collecting some data from other sources, making um, connections yeah. that actually identify you as Jim Hogan, even though your, your, your record was not um, private, right. uh, it was not uh, personal, it was, it was anonymous, but there's enough study out there that makes clear that it's um, from enough data you can still go back to the source and yeah, you will identify individuals and you will all have all this um, data reconstructed from it, multiple I mean, sources. It, so It looks like you're piling on. I mean that second scoop of ice cream might show up on your health record, yeah, right? Yeah. Got, uh, the third <laughs> sure does. And, uh, but okay, who uses waves? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah, man, if you live in Santa Cruz, you do. And so that's a great example of everybody using your data. Now, it was really great before everybody was using it, <laughs> you know? But, uh, but okay, that was kind of a useful experiment, but I don't know, it's lost its utility, I think, right? So, so another whole lecture. We should take another question right here. Uh, hi, I'm Edmund. Uh, it seems as the most AI projects will run on new type of chips. So it's silicon. Silicon is hard. And now we have a big wave of consolidation in the chip industry. So my expectation is that in five years there will be two electronic chips companies left. So the, my question is to those who are in the f uh, startup industry, what's the point of having a chip startup in that kind of environment? So, I mean, if you saw Chris's data, um, actually, we're seeing an expansion in the number of small chip companies because of the opportunities. The, the trend 15 years ago was absolutely in the direction you're talking about. We had, you know, everyone trying to chase this one socket in that phone thing that was going into our pockets, and it required in huge investments you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and thousand plus person design teams all chasing this, you know, um, unicorn of an opportunity. Um, for better and worse, that market changed a lot. Uh, large semiconductor companies started scattering those design teams into different application areas and some interesting things happened. Um, so we have a set of emerging technologies. We Today we're talking a lot about the neural network space. There's been some fascinating work done in, in trying to accelerate things like uh, cryptocurrency, you know, blockchain activities. You know, there's a, there's a lot of small companies incredibly economically focused. Um, 
companies in, in that space. And so the, the, actually there are, from my perspective, a lot more small semiconductor companies today than there were five years ago. Yeah, I mean, let's just stay on the cryptocurrencies for a second, right? So I got a company, it's a, it's an ASIC company, builds ASICs for people, and they, they got a pipeline of 20 Bitcoin-like companies. They're bringing their FPGA algorithms over to build an ASIC because they can do it you know, 100 times faster, and 100 times faster means they have that much more revenue they can produce. So economically, it's worthwhile. So we'll, we're seeing a lot of little guys, I mean, a lot of uh, small volume processors. Yeah. I think there are really three, um, three trends that are woven together. Um, first of all, I actually agree with the basic premise of the question. I don't think that there is something about neural networks that say, oh yes, semiconductor consolidation is going to be reversed. Because that's much more about manufacturing scale and distribution channels, which are not fundamentally changed by uh, neural network technology. And so I think there are a lot of startups. I think some of those startups will fail. I think some of those startups will be acquired. A very small number of them may survive over the long run, but we're not going to see 17 of them as major semiconductor companies 10 years from now. Impossible. But I think there's also the trend that says that a lot of semiconductor innovation is now taking place in systems companies not in semiconductor companies. And it really reflects the fact that due to integration and due to the cleverness of software methods and higher level algorithms like deep learning, that system companies often have much more of the really important rare insights compared to chip companies. The chip companies are good at producing chips for the problems that are already very well understood. But I think we're enjoying a period of very rapid change in how you solve some of these really big problems. And that advantages the system companies. And some of them, like Google most recently, will choose to leverage that know-how in their own silicon designs. So it's true, we do have this consolidation taking place in the chip companies, but in background you have this re-vertical integration taking place in lots of other places, often with very particular uh, applications in mind. And I think it is, in fact, this phenomenon where more and more of the real value add in systems is happening in higher layers in software. And partly because Moore's Law deceleration, partly because there's just so many interesting problems out there to solve that can be solved at a software level. And so, just as a a very personal dimension of it. I've been a semiconductor guy um, since I was working on 1K dynamic RAMs a very long time ago. And I really reached the point as an investor, I don't invest in semiconductor companies because that's not where the action is. I really believe with my heart and my wallet <laughs> that the innovation opportunities, the pace at which you can do things, is much higher in the, in the software domain. So I am starting a new, a new company in uh, speech processing applications. It's a very technically intensive. It cares a lot about high throughput compute. And it's never, I hope, going to do chips. <laughs> hey, let's, let's just look at uh, the Google example, right? So they're not going to be a merchant supplier of semiconductor. They're going to consume all that and all likelihood of insight. Well, maybe they will and ship Android on it or something. But, but with that said, it's unlikely that they'll end up being a big volume semiconductor guy, right? So the systems folks are realizing that they get a lot more cycles and a lot less energy by getting to an ASIC. So all, all this is true. Yeah, this is a you know, constant debate. Jim, this was an observation from Twitter um, from Catherine, and she seems she, she feels like there's a disconnect between Silicon Valley and humanities. Um, uh, because she basically says, tech people think we just sit quietly reading a physical book. Not a lot of uh, what we do is construct, analyze narrative, who reads labels, code, humanists. So, is, that was just her observation, but 
would would that be a a topic of social engineering? Wow. Well, I'm going to overlay this to my panel. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll do it to my person to my immediate right. right. Thanks a lot for that question. What was the question? <laughs> it wasn't a question. It was an observation that there's a disconnect between the technical community and the humanities. Yeah, I see. So in some sense, that's true because um, we, we still keep trying to understand what we do here. Uh, on the technical side. As I mentioned earlier, it's like we don't even know why it works. How are we supposed to explain that to someone else um, and then understand the consequences of what we're trying to do? I think that's a bit, a bit too early. We, this discussion will come, I think, and we will have it. Um, and there will be discussions about the implications of what the technology will do. Um, the question really is, uh, when is the point um, to have this discussion? What's the thing we need to find out. And um, I think right now, we are still trying to understand the consequences, the potential ones of what we're doing. Um, and obviously, we need to be careful with what we're trying to release here. I am struck with the fact that the, the, the premise of the question is sort of that we are just specialists in Silicon Valley. But in fact, we are humans first and specialists second. We have families, we have all of the usual problems. The question of our ultimate demise weighs on all of us, especially as we get older. And, and so we're living the human experience first, but like so many people in so many places, in so many parts of the world, the best way for us to survive, feed our families, do something interesting is to specialize in a particular way. And we specialize around electronics and software here in the valley, just as brain surgeons specialize and farmers eking out an existence in some demanding ecosystem also are very highly tuned specialists for that. Uh, but we are, I would claim, humans first and specialists second. Yeah, I just pick up on that. Thanks for uh, giving me some cover while I came up with an answer. <laughs> but uh, uh, the way I see it is, uh, rarely can I fix anything. I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm a math guy, right? But I often can make things better. And that's the specialization side. I can bring our skills and our knowledge to, at, to, for a tool for everybody. That's, that's our value proposition, I believe. Question here. Hi, uh, I'm I'm an old analog guy, and I'm looking at the neural networks and thinking those look like analog circuits, yep. and all the math is like fast spice, yep. uh, which is something that most of the digital guys I see in the panel don't really deal with. So, is EDA ready for this? Actually, I think. Uh, you, you, thanks for bringing it up. I you know I end up you know people that know me say you turn everything into a spice problem, Jim. <laughs> you know, but I kind of see it way. It's a sparse matrix, right? So matrix solvers, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Analog's great because you just cycle. You only use power when you cycle, right? So you put it on the edge where you have a battery maybe, and you can get ten times ten years worth of battery life out of it. So I think the analog, me personally, that's one of the things I'm going to go work on is I'm interested in that, as long with other things, but the analog solution here is, is a good one. You're, you're bringing up a great point. I mean, I think it's still the case with lots of people having tried to make it otherwise, analog is still more art than science. And that's a little bit like the whole neural network problem today. <laughs> Where, as we say, we don't know why the things work, right? So people come up with an insight, well, gosh, if I add another layer of this shape here, maybe I'll get better results. I'll, let me throw a bunch of data at it and backpropagate and train, and my gosh, it's worse. You know? And so it, it really is that domain. So um, yeah. is EDM so it's a big fit? Pardon me? It's a good fit. Yeah. <laughs> Two types of black magic together. Yeah. So, so it, I don't think it's an EDA problem yet. It could become one, but I don't think it's an EDA problem yet. I'm going to take issue with the premise of the question, because <laughs> I don't think the interesting dichotomy is between analog and digital. I think the interesting dichotomy is between programmable and non-programmable. Oh, okay. Because non-programmable fundamentally assumes knowledge has stabilized, 
we are able to freeze this problem in a way that we are going to either go build the digital circuit or go build the analog circuit that, that does this one thing, and that we're willing not to really change it in important ways for the next two or three years that it takes to get that either analog or digital chip out there. I think that if the large arc of technical history tells us anything, it says that software wins. That, of course, everything's running on some hardware deep down inside, but the layers of innovation and the layers of value add that are, that are accumulating in software are so rich and so deep that we really need to be ready to leverage those things. And yes, of course, the non-programmable system is always more efficient than the programmable system. But the non-programmable system is really a bet against learning. And history says people are going to go on being creative. So I bet on programmability every time. Programmable analog, great. So programmable a, digital, great. But just not non-programmable. There's a fair amount of startups going into the analog space and, and machine learning. So that's um, a, a valid point. Um, yeah. But I think that the, the, the question earlier connects to that is the, the systems question. And um, if you look at the most profitable systems companies in Silicon Valley, they actually do have some hardware business inside. It's actually a, a good thing to have it. it so I don't uh, fully agree with the software only thing if it comes to um, making a valuable business. Now um, the panel's getting fun. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that there isn't a role for hardware, but you think about the software experience first. And that's where the innovation, I think, has predominantly been driving value for the last couple of decades. I think it's actually not even software anymore. It's the ideation from where you start. It's the experience that you provide to the user. And it doesn't really matter if it's hardware or software. It's only means to an end. So if you look at it from this perspective, maybe um, we can say that it doesn't really matter how you implement it. Uh, software is maybe the most flexible thing to do it and get to the money quickly. You know, right. If you make it profitable, you want to add some hardware, but the user actually doesn't care as long yeah. as it works. I'm really glad we invited you. Because <laughs> we would have never got that out of any of us. And so, uh, yeah, so let's think about Chris's chart, you know, the edge, the cloud. Over here, maybe some analog. Not much programmability. If you have some programmability and you can afford it, okay. But if it's going to be low energy and you want it to last a lot of time, you know, pro software takes a little energy. And so that might, there might be a place, right? I don't disagree with you that software, the stack of software has allowed us to have a platform for multi-generations without changing the hardware, which is really cool. Right. But, but Jim, changing a trillion devices costs a little bit of money, right? So if you got it wrong and you deploy it, then having some programmability is incredibly <laughs> valuable, right? Oh, oh that, now they're piling on. Bring, <laughs> bring, bring it on. That's great. Well, and, and I think there's ample evidence that to some extent you can have it both ways. Yeah. I mean, you can have things that are very highly energy efficient and which are highly programmable. And most of the really significant hardware innovations have taken place in things that are pretty programmable. Yeah. That's the reason why we're so fixated on processors no, I, actually, along I, the way. I don't know that I even care as long as it does it meets the parameters of the, uh, of the, the system problem, right? And so, you know, darn it, we're out of time. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're running a little over, but could you just do one question here? Sure. Right? This gentleman right here, he's been waiting. Hello. Uh, so uh, I want to know your views regarding artificial intelligence uh, for securing networks and infrastructure. I mean, there, there's a couple of startups which actually work for it, but there's always kind of a debate going on. Also, tools related to it. My second question is like securing your artificial intelligence systems. So, so I mean, I think in defending networks, pattern matching is fundamental. Yeah. In that sense, we know artificial neural networks have a leg up because you know you can feed a lot of example attack vectors at them, yeah. and, and they will they will recognize the known ones very very quickly. Um, how good are they going to be at predicting other ones? I think there's a lot of interesting work going on there now to figure it out. Yeah, it's an immune system problem, right? You inoculate yourself with a known virus, and the, the CNNs will work well, right? Are they going to figure out new viruses? But, I mean, there are a half a dozen uh, security companies using pretty serious deep learning on my 
my list, and so I take it as a proof by example <laughs> that, that it must work to some degree. Oh, sure. though, though how you get enough examples. I mean, the number of examples you can get r relative to, say, what you can get in areas like vision or speech has got to be a lot lower. Yeah. And it makes it much tougher to generalize if you don't have a whole lot of data. Kind of back to the training question in a way, right? Well, uh, did we get to your second question? Not okay. yet. Okay, not yet. Somebody remember the second question? Yeah. Um, how do you secure these artificial intelligence systems? Now, at some level, um, at the sort of, it's a piece of software running on a piece of hardware. The issues are not fundamentally different from any other software running on a piece of hardware. But there are, of course, some additional areas of exposure. Um, one of them is, as I think Drew alluded to, uh, oh, and no, and, uh, and Reich alluded to, spoofing these systems is actually a big issue. And so there are ways of sort of getting at them through their back door in new ways and, and getting them to do things uh, that weren't expected by giving them inputs that they never expected. Um, and, and so I think that actually that, that robustness of the problem definition is leaving lots and lots of big wide open doors that do represent kind of serious um, um, security and robustness questions. Yeah, yeah, I mean that's, you know, at least my few projects I'm involved with, it's finding the data, excuse me, the behavior that is malbehavior in a breach, right? So, so that is a big challenge. Can, you know, so we'll see where it goes. If it's okay, I'd like to conclude if I can. Yes, yes okay. you can. And uh, the, the next event will be in the new year, February 23rd, right? Yeah, and while... 21st. 21st. Sorry. And uh, while we're on the subject, you know, as you, as I tried to explain in prior ones, we, you know, we set this up eight or nine months ago, and and uh, I've been fortunate enough to have August panel uh, volunteer their time and and join us, and we've we've taken a little bit of criticism, a lot of criticism, for not having uh, females on our panels. Well, obviously there's females that uh, can help us on under on this understanding, and I can guarantee you that next year as we work on the. Uh, on the agenda and the panel discussions, we'll have representation for sure. It's uh, hopefully you understand that we, the planning of this took a while. And uh, I want to, while I'm here, I'd like to thank my August panel. You guys did fabulous. Thank you so much for thank giving you. us of your time. I, I really appreciate the support of San Jose State and San Jose State University. I, I hope and wish for them uh, as practitioners that you guys, you all can uh, develop the cognitive science uh, a curriculum here and let's see some students graduating with master's degrees and undergraduate degrees in cognitive science. That would be our reward. And I would really appreciate it. And I do appreciate the time that the university has given me this year. Uh, you know, I, you know it's, I'm, a, I'm a, what do they call it, illustrious alumni, right? I wasn't when I was here. <laughs> You know, so so you know you got it. So there's some kids out uh, going to school right now that are probably you know Jim Ogans and and uh, it wasn't for San Jose State, I, I certainly wouldn't have been here today. So I want to thank the university for not kicking me out when they did, <laughs> and uh, and uh, making uh, my life really really making a difference in my life. Uh, one of the people that's not here today is em Emily Emily uh, Lang. She's gotten pneumonia for God's sakes, and Emily was uh, the real driving force behind this. You know, anybody that's ever tried to manage me, it's been pretty hard. And God bless her, she managed to get all this thing done. So God bless Emily, I hope she gets well sooner. Anything yeah. else? No, I just, uh, one more time for Chris Rowan, Drew Wingard, James Gump, and Reich Brinkman, and the big kahuna, the real one, Mr. Jim Hogan, right here. Thanks for hanging out. Yes, we'll see you on the 21st of February. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.